Through a ridiculous amount of vigilance and persistence, I was able to score one of those elusive PlayStation 5s. Given the state of the world right now, they're likely to remain difficult to get for some time. In a way, that's okay. It's easy for me to say this since I have one of the coveted devices, but there aren't a ton of great reasons to own a PlayStation 5 just yet. That will change, and by the time it does, hopefully they'll be readily available. When I did my review of the Nintendo Switch a few years ago, that was an exciting, untested product category. There was a lot to talk about regarding the usability of the device and the viability of the concept. While Nintendo's console strategy has changed drastically over the years, and Microsoft has shifted focus towards services around games, Sony has been fairly consistent since they got into the business. The PlayStation 5 isn't a new concept. You know what this is. It's a revision, not a revolution. Mind you, that's not a qualitative judgment. It's more of an observation about the state of the home game console. We're no longer making these big, obvious leaps forward. Improvements are more incremental than they used to be. That happens when a product category matures. The leap between PS1 and 2 is certainly much more impactful than the leap from PS4 to PS5. Just because the PS5 is familiar doesn't mean it isn't exciting in its own way. This console promises increased graphical power, decreased loading times, and a more immersive experience with the new DualSense controller. It's backwards compatible with just about every PS4 game too, and some of them have been or will be optimized to run better or display higher quality visuals on PS5. The first thing I noticed about the console is just how big it is. With increasing power comes more heat and fan noise, the PS4 could be distractingly loud while playing the most demanding titles. The larger size of the PS5 is partially to help with cooling and keeping things quieter. So far, it's accomplished that mission. I got the base model, not the digital edition of the console. The disk drive is actually the thing that pushed me to try and get a PS5 sooner than later. I'm one of those dorks who still occasionally buys movies on disk, and I really wanted to be able to watch The Lord of the Rings in 4K HDR. Given the dominance of streaming services, I imagine I'll be in the extreme minority of people using this function of the console. Using discs might seem increasingly antiquated, but I still think the disc drive version of the PS5 is the way to go, for a variety of reasons. The digital edition is $100 cheaper, and that's an attractive upfront discount. I actually prefer digital games. On Switch and PC, I buy just about everything digitally. But without a disk drive, you cut yourself off from the used games market, from borrowing games from friends, and if you own physical copies of PS4 games, you won't be able to play them unless you rebuy them as digital purchases. I ended up with quite a few PS4 discs, mostly because of sales. Digital games go on sale more often than they used to, but physical games are still more likely to be discounted in order to clear inventory. Digital sellers have no such incentive. Depending on your situation, that $100 of savings between versions might be made up over time by savings on individual games. If nothing else, it's a nice option to have. The PlayStation 5's solid-state drive is reportedly one of the more expensive components of the system, and that's probably why it's only 825 gigabytes. Only 667 are available to users for games, saves, apps, screenshots, and video captures. With the ever-growing size of games, that space doesn't go as far as it used to. You will inevitably have to delete things or otherwise manage your storage. It just won't be possible to keep your whole library installed on the PS5's internal drive. And unlike the PS4, the drive is not user replaceable. Fortunately, PS4 games can be installed and played from an external USB connected drive, but PS5 games must be run off of internal storage. A post-launch update allows PS5 games to be stored on USB drives to free up internal space, but you have to transfer them back in order to play. In the future, you'll be able to add additional fast storage to the console via M2 drives. But not just any drive will work, and exactly how expensive they'll be, we don't know yet. For now, this is a bit of a problem, and it could end up being a significant hidden cost of PS5 ownership. Ironically, by putting faster storage in the PS5 at the cost of capacity, Load times in-game have been traded for data management time out of game. Aside from the SSD, the most touted feature of the PS5 
is the new DualSense controller. The DualSense features haptic feedback throughout, which is reminiscent of HD rumble in the Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons. The DualSense's adaptive triggers are similar to the rumble-capable impulse triggers on the Xbox wireless controller family. In both cases, the DualSense is capable of producing a wider array of physical feedback. The haptics can do traditional rumble, but it's also able to produce a variety of rumble textures, if you will. The triggers are capable of rumble and varying levels of tension, making them harder or easier to pull depending on the situation. They can also be made to feel similar to the Nintendo GameCube's shoulder buttons, a smooth analog trigger that turns into a click at the end. The best demonstration of the DualSense features is Astro's Playroom, a bite-sized platformer that comes pre-installed on every PS5. Astro's Playroom is a tech demo for the DualSense, like Wii Sports was for the Wii Remote back in 2006. Astro's Playroom feels like a Nintendo game in all the best and worst ways. It's a playful, toy-like game, full of polish, charm, and catchy music. There's obvious love and reverence for the legacy of the company it's representing. It's also chock full of gimmicks and motion controls, but it is a good showcase for the capabilities of the new controller. In that respect, it accomplishes its goal. Every aspect of the controller, new and old, is utilized in the game to some degree. The haptic feedback is nearly constant as you move around and interact with the environment. While HD rumble on the Switch feels akin to cell phone vibration, the haptics on the DualSense are much closer to traditional controller rumble, but a subtler and more varied version of that. Traditional rumble would get irritating if used this frequently, but the haptics don't, even if they are employed a little overzealously to show off the controller. The adaptive triggers are used in a variety of ways, usually in combination with motion control. In one segment, you climb a rock wall using the triggers for grip and motion control to swing to the next handhold. In another, triggers control the tension of a spring as you bounce from platform to platform. When using a bow, the trigger mimics the tension of the string as you pull it back. When you use a minigun, the triggers rumble, emulating recoil. In a segment where you turn into a rocket ship, the triggers use both tension for varying amounts of thrust and lots of rumble. It's all really neat with the notable exception of this section where you roll a ball around using the touchpad. It works, but it's an awful method of control and clearly inferior to just using traditional analog sticks. And that's what I'd say about any new controller feature. If it's not better than something we already had, if it doesn't serve a new purpose, then it's probably just a gimmick. Blowing into a controller's microphone is never going to make a game more fun for me. Most of the time, I prefer to forget about the controller altogether. I don't want to think about this rumbling piece of plastic in my hands that exists very much outside the game world. Features that remind me of this are not necessarily welcome, nor are features that make inputs more difficult and less precise. To me, the haptic feedback is a novelty. It's not a convincing sensory experience. I don't get a drastically different feel from the rumble when I walk on different surfaces in Astro's Playroom, as I heard some claim. I think the built-in controller speaker is doing a lot of the heavy lifting to fool your brain here. The speaker is much better than other controller speakers, but it's still a little tinny and sticks out as a low quality audio source if you have a decent speaker system. The speaker sounds do mask the sometimes unpleasant sounds of the haptics and rumble triggers though. I heard a lot of buzz about the DualSense features around launch, that it was a potential sea change in how we experience games. And while the features are definitely cool, I'm skeptical. It's going to depend entirely on how developers implement the DualSense features, of course. Most will use a much lighter touch than Astro's Playroom, and that's probably for the best. I think the triggers especially will fit naturally into many games and be a welcome inclusion. Aside from the new features, the DualSense is a really nice controller. It's amazing how little Sony's controller design has changed over the years. Just looking at them, you wouldn't think there's much of a difference between the DualShock 4 and the DualSense. But when I picked the older controller back up, I immediately noticed how slight changes to the shape, size, and weight of the newer controller improve the ergonomics. It just feels like a more premium controller. And that's also reflected in the cost. If you want additional controllers, it's $70. That cost is more understandable than the $70 price tag on the Switch Pro controller. 
you can use DualShock 4 controllers with the PS5, but only with PS4 games. And that's a shame. It's more restrictive than necessary. I wish Sony would allow games that don't make specific use of DualSense features to work on older controllers, because $70 for extra controllers is really steep, especially when the PS4 controller is functionally almost exactly the same. I haven't had any problems with my DualSense so far, but it is worth noting that there are reports of stick drift, just like on the Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons. I hope that's not a widespread issue here. It certainly is with the Switch. Historically, the choice between console and PC gaming has been one of convenience versus control. PC gaming gives you greater control over your experience with graphical options, custom setups, mod support, and access to generations worth of games. That typically comes with a greater upfront cost for the hardware and a lot more headaches and technical issues. Consoles have traditionally been plug and play. Just put your game in and go. In recent years, the PC and console experiences have moved closer together. PC gaming has gotten a little more streamlined and consoles have given players more control at the cost of being more complicated to use. Now you have to navigate a bunch of menus, download updates, manage storage, and play with settings. There's more between you and your game than there used to be. Most of the time the PS5 does provide that relatively simple and easy experience that we're used to on consoles. But there are some quirks that seem like they should have been avoidable. The two most important factors for a system user interface are speed and navigational ease. The PS5 UI is definitely fast. Jumping between menus, apps, and system features is nearly instantaneous. I especially like that the PlayStation Store loads just by navigating there from the main menu. You don't have to open it like it's a separate app. The limiting factor here is your internet speed, not waiting for sluggish software like on the PS4. As for navigational ease, it's fine, but it could be better. Overall, the layout and features of the OS are broadly similar to the PS4, but it's a little more stuffed with content and a little less easy to get around in a few key ways. On PS4, one press of the PlayStation button took you back to the home menu, and another press back to the game. It was simple, fast, easy. Holding the PlayStation button brought up a menu where you could quickly turn off or put the console in sleep mode. And that worked from anywhere, in games, apps, and the home menu. PS5 has sort of reversed this. One press brings up a customizable quick menu called the Control Center. This is meant to facilitate most of the options players need while in game so that you don't have to go all the way back to the main menu. For those players that play online, use the party system, and stream directly from the console, this is probably very useful. But I don't do any of that stuff, at least not very frequently, and I find myself needing to go to the main menu more often, which takes extra button presses. In general, I find that I have to press more buttons on the PS5 to do these common tasks. Partially, I'm just not used to the new system yet, but I also think it is less intuitive. One great new feature is activity cards. These can be accessed by that quick menu, and they provide a list of activities in-game and allow you to jump directly to them. This is great for level-based games or open-world games, but it is something that is a specific PlayStation feature, meaning third parties may or may not support it very well. In the few games I've tried that support it well, it's really neat, though like a lot of the PS5's new features, not essential. The main menu is split between games and media. I like that broad separation of different uses. I think it would have been nice to go a step farther and put news, updates, and the store on its own tab and leave the games tab purely as a launcher. But Sony wants that PlayStation Store front and center, whether you like it or not. One definite improvement over the PS4 is the share capabilities, which have been rebranded as Create on the PS5. Screenshots are pretty much instant as opposed to the short delay on the PS4. Both photos and videos can capture HDR expanded color and luma ranges, and you can capture up to an hour of 4K 60fps HDR video at a time, provided you have the storage space. I'm very impressed with those options. I think the most annoying and disappointing aspect of the PlayStation 5 experience is how Sony has chosen to handle game versions and upgrades. Rather than treating each game as a single entity and just optimizing them in the background depending on what console you're on, there are separate, distinct PS4 and PS5 versions of many cross-generation games. 
Sometimes PS4 games will be upgradable to PS5 for free. Sometimes the upgrade is paid. Sometimes upgrades are patches. Sometimes they're whole new downloads. It's confusing because there are no standards for this across the board. Not even for Sony first party games. On the Xbox side, Microsoft pushed something called a smart delivery. The idea was to take the guesswork out of the process for players. It's a feature that's supposed to automatically ensure that you're running the version of the game most optimized for your platform. And I wish PlayStation had something like this. In the earlier days of the PS5, games would sometimes default to the PS4 version of games, even if a native PS5 version existed and was present on the console. That behavior has been patched. Now the system is supposed to warn you if you're launching the last generation version of a game. But I still had this happen to me. When I downloaded Destiny 2, both the PS4 and PS5 versions downloaded automatically. And when I launched the game, it defaulted to the PS4 version without warning. I had to look up how to switch versions from the launcher because it's not obvious, and I had no idea that both versions had been downloaded to begin with. Some games, in order to transfer save data between versions, require you to launch the older version of the game first. This was the case with games like Spider-Man and Marvel's Avengers. Cloud saves for PlayStation Plus members don't automatically download. You have to manually download save data from the cloud. That process really should be automatic when you download a game or at least there should be a system dialogue that asks you if you want to download save data. I really wish that game versions weren't treated separately, but either for technical or business reasons, they are, and the burden for navigating all of this falls on the user. Over time, this will be less of an issue, but right now, and for the foreseeable future, it's not ideal. The PS5 is a 4K console. It also, laughably, claims to do 8K. I'm sure it will technically be capable of outputting 8K whenever Sony gets around to adding that in a future update, but I'm also sure that we won't see high-end 3D games running anywhere close to that resolution. It's a ridiculous thing to tout. For all intents and purposes, these are 4K boxes. The PS4 and Xbox One sometimes struggle to hit their targets of full 1080 HD but this generation of machines are more appropriately powered for their performance targets. Video games have a constant tug of war between resolution, frame rate, and graphical quality. Each of these competes for limited system resources. Emphasizing one usually comes at the cost of the others. In the past, graphical quality has been prioritized to sell games, consoles, and computer hardware. Resolution has been prioritized to sell TVs and monitors. I think it's about time that frame rate got a little love. That's what I'd like to see this generation. Assisted by techniques like dynamic resolution and various upscaling methods, I'm hoping 4K 60fps becomes the standard for this generation. In the PC gaming space, I've been sensitive to frame rate for a long time. It's not a PC elitist thing, it's a quality of life issue. Not every game needs to run at 60fps or above, many are just fine at a consistent 30 frames per second. But in a lot of games, particularly action games, first-person games, or any game where timing and responsive controls are required, a higher frame rate makes a huge difference, not just to how a game looks, but to how it feels. As the PS4 generation wore on, I became increasingly dissatisfied with how games ran on the platform. The big prestige exclusive titles looked great, but felt substandard. And sometimes, as good as the games could look when relatively still, Turning the camera suddenly made everything a blurry mess. Playing games like God of War, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Red Dead Redemption 2, I wished for a better, smoother, more responsive experience. Because how a game feels affects your whole impression, and it's at least as important as how a game looks. Something that might get in the way of my 60fps wish is the rise of real-time ray tracing. A proper explanation of ray tracing is complicated, technical, and well beyond my expertise. The upshot for video games is more realistic and responsive lighting. Ray tracing mimics the way that light behaves in the real world, rather than the computational shortcuts normally employed in video games. Ray tracing is going to be a big deal for how games are rendered and developed, but right now, it's still early days. RT is being implemented in some PS5 games already in different ways, and it's likely to be a term we'll hear a lot to sell games and push graphics technology. In Spider-Man Remastered and Spider-Man Miles Morales, ray tracing can be toggled on and off with different graphics modes, so we can see side by side what it's doing. 
These games use the technique primarily for reflections. Most scenes are nearly identical with and without. Where you really see the difference is around reflective surfaces, like glass. With ray tracing enabled, you see your character, pedestrians, and traffic reflected. The reflections of the cityscape are accurate to what they should be. Without ray tracing, there are fake reflections, which can do a convincing job if you don't scrutinize them too much. While you're playing, you're likely going to be focusing on other things. But if you stop and look at them, they definitely aren't as good, and in some cases, they're way off. At a glance, the additional realism brought by ray tracing isn't a huge deal. The fake methods of lighting in video games have gotten really good over the past couple decades. But our eyes and brains are very good at detecting fakeness, even if we can't quite articulate what's wrong with an image. Over time, RT will help that next step towards greater visual realism and reactivity. I'm curious to see how much developers will be able to implement ray tracing using the limited ray tracing ability of the PS5 and Xbox Series X. The new consoles have specialized hardware for RT acceleration, but neither stack up to the latest video cards from NVIDIA and AMD. PS5 exclusive Returnal runs at 4K 60fps with ray tracing, but the RT implementation is fairly limited. The upcoming PS5 version of Metro Exodus is promised to have extensive ray tracing features and will target 4K 60fps as well, but that game was originally built for last generation consoles. What will Naughty Dog, Sony Santa Monica, or Sucker Punch be able to do with the PS5? That's the question. Will performance again be sacrificed for graphical gains? Or will new rendering techniques and efficiency breakthroughs allow us to have a harmonious balance of resolution, frame rate, and graphical polish? At this stage, we're seeing many games give some choice to players. Do you want the most pristine image or better performance? As a player who cares about the technical aspects and feel of games, I love having the choice available to me while not having to worry about an extensive laundry list of graphics options like on PC. Load times are improved as advertised. Games launch quickly and load relatively fast. Some are definitely faster than others. The speed of the SSD makes it possible, but the biggest improvements are seen in native PS5 games that are specifically developed to take advantage of the faster storage. In other words, the games themselves need to be optimized to get the full benefit. Fast travel in the PS5 Spider-Man games is nearly instantaneous, but going back to the PS4 version of Spider-Man running on PS5, we can see how much software optimization matters. That older version that's running at a lower resolution and frame rate, mind you, loads significantly slower. Despite that, it's still a big improvement over the PS4 version. There aren't a ton of native PS5 games right now, and even fewer exclusives. Given the residual effects of the pandemic, it's likely to stay that way for longer than usual. I wouldn't be surprised to see some major games being delayed out of 2021, so backwards compatibility is an even more significant feature than it would have been otherwise. If you're coming from the PS4, then the PS5 is a significant upgrade right away. It automatically takes advantage of any game with PS4 Pro enhancements, and there are a lot of those. If you have a PS4 Pro, however, the boost to PS4 games is going to be minimal, except for games that have been specifically updated to take advantage of PS5 hardware, and there aren't very many of those at this point. It's a little frustrating knowing that games locked at 30 FPS are probably capable of running at 60 on the PS5, but they can't without updates from Sony or the developer. Some first-party and console-exclusive games from the PS4 have gotten such updates, Ghost of Tsushima, Days Gone, God of War, Ratchet and Clank. Updates really improve the experience. I never played Ghost of Tsushima, Days Gone, or Ratchet and Clank on PS4, but all of them run at 4K 60fps on PS5, and despite not being native PS5 games, they look great and feel wonderfully responsive. I did play God of War on PS4. The game always felt just a little sluggish and blurry in motion. Having this game now available in 4K60 is a game changer. I think if I had played it this way my first time through, my impression would have been markedly better, because it feels so much better and more responsive now. And it makes me hope even more that PS5 games will prioritize frame rate, because I would hate to go back to a 30 FPS experience in the upcoming sequel. Figuring out whether a game has been updated for PS5 and what those updates do can be a little tricky. 
Instead of an official Sony source, I found the best reference to be a user-created site. Backwards compatibility is an area where Microsoft is clearly ahead at the moment. The latest Xboxes have support for games going all the way back to the original Xbox, and many of them are enhanced with higher resolutions, frame rates, texture filtering, and other improvements. Microsoft has invested a lot of time to update older games on their platform, and not just first-party games either. Sony has not done this, and that's a shame because there are lots of great PS4 titles that would hugely benefit from an increase to frame rate and resolution. I'm a little afraid that instead of getting updates to existing titles, we might see a whole new slew of lightly remastered games. Arguably, this happened with Spider-Man already. Instead of getting an update, it received a remastered re-release. The remastered game is only available for an extra $20 if you purchase Spider-Man Miles Morales. That's a great deal if you've never bought the original PS4 game, but for those of us who did, it feels a little bit exploitative. The remaster is nice to have. It adds the ray-traced reflections previously discussed, and of course, the option to run at 60 FPS. But aside from that, many of its changes are artistic and subjective in nature, rather than clear upgrades. I would have been perfectly happy with just a 60 FPS option for the original PS4 game on PS5. Sony, Insomniac, or any other developer doesn't owe players free updates, but it would be a nice pro-consumer move, especially since PlayStation is doing so well. That's exactly why they don't need to do any of this work for free, though. The PS5 is selling as fast as they can make them already. I think expectations around backwards compatibility have changed during the last generation. Porting games from PS4 to PS5 is much simpler than PS3 to PS4. Under the hood, the more recent consoles are basically PCs. That makes certain aspects of cross-generation and multi-platform development simpler. At the end of the day, as a consumer, I'd like my old games to work on my new system, and I'd like them to run better at higher resolutions. I don't think that's too much to ask from the leading console company, especially since Microsoft has heavily invested in making older games playable and optimized. The PlayStation 5 represents an amazing value. It's some really powerful hardware for the money. You can certainly build a more capable gaming PC, but for $500? Not even close, especially right now with the PC component market in disarray. You can't beat these new consoles in price for performance. That goes for Xbox Series X too. Along with the PlayStation Plus collection and Xbox Game Pass on the Microsoft side, you can get a whole lot for your money right now with either current gen system. I didn't get an Xbox though, I never even considered it. Not because of brand loyalty to PlayStation or because I don't like Xbox, it's because I play games primarily on PC and Microsoft has made the sensible decision to invest in that market again. With a Nintendo Switch, a PS5, and a PC spec for gaming, I can play just about any game I want. And that's pretty awesome. If I didn't have a gaming PC, the choice between PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X would be more difficult. Although I've generally favored Sony's exclusives and first-party games, Xbox Game Pass provides a better value than PlayStation Plus or PlayStation Now. With PS5 exclusive games, Sony has increased their prices from $60 to $70 US. That's kind of a tough pill to swallow. I have a hard time imagining myself buying too many games at that price. Not only do the games really have to be worth it, they have to be more worth my $70 than something else. Games not only cost money, they cost precious free time. The higher the price for a game, the more likely I am just to wait for price drops or sales, or to not even take the risk on an unfamiliar game at all. And I realize that behavior can reinforce a more risk-averse mentality from companies like Sony. These big expensive games have to be hits, they have to have broad appeal, and apparently, now they have to cost $70. Although Sony's first party output has been superior to Microsoft's during the previous generation, the recent spree of developer acquisitions by Xbox could change that narrative going forward. Studios like Obsidian, Double Fine, Mojang, and many of the developers in the Bethesda acquisition are responsible for some of my favorite games ever. It's a formidable boost of creative talent and potential to the Xbox lineup. In terms of hardware, the PlayStation 5 is a great deal. In terms of software and ecosystem, it's beaten by Xbox and PC at the moment. 
What I'd like to see from Sony is continued backwards compatibility improvements for first-party PS4 games, some kind of competitor for Xbox Game Pass, and a robust, diverse lineup of new first-party games. I think we'll get at least two out of the three. A lot of the issues I have with the PlayStation 5 are nitpicks, and they're fixable. My biggest gripes are the business decisions around the console, the way game versions are handled, some decisions about game pricing, but it's a little hard to be too upset by those things when you consider that the console itself is being sold at a loss. It's a great piece of hardware, highly capable of providing amazing visuals at higher frame rates. Playing a game at 4K 60fps HDR on an OLED TV with surround sound is an amazing coalescence of technologies that would have been unthinkable and mind-blowing when the original PlayStation hit the market. Having that as a potential new standard, something regular and expected, is cause for celebration.